Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today, for the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia, we are going to be taking some time to observe a very cool fruit that will turn any user immediately into a girl's best friend, being the Kira Kira no Mi. The Kira Kira no Mi is a Paramecia type fruit that allows its user to transform any or all of their body into a super shiny diamond. It was consumed in the series by the third division commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, Jozu, and made its first appearance during the Marine for Dark. This fruit, as many others do, takes its name from a Japanese onomatopoeia, in this case being Kira Kira, which is allegedly the sound of sparkling, primarily referring to the shininess of precious things such as gemstones or jewelry in general. An idea that we have many, many words for in English, including glitter, sparkle, glisten, or even even the lesser used twinkle. Now, as for which of those wonderful words the English translation would choose to use, well, we're still waiting on that, actually. That's right, for the first time in this encyclopedia, this fruit has no official translation as of yet. And in fact, we only know the fruit's Japanese name thanks to the One Piece Vivia card data book. So throw your bets in the comments, but I'm going to go with the Sparkle Sparkle fruit, because why not? But what we essentially have here is one of the most simple fruits we've examined, because in terms of abilities, it's very minimalist. You can turn parts of yourself into diamond. That's very much it. And as a result, the selling point of this fruit is very much what one could accomplish as a giant diamond. And I'd have to say that outside of combat, it's, it's a pretty limited field. But first up, I guess it's worth noting that diamond is the hardest naturally occurring substance in the world, with the word naturally being very important, because of course, in this day and age, with the radical power of science, we can form compounds much tougher than diamond, but we're starting out with some pretty damn high standards here anyway. Standards which would naturally give its user an immunity to effectively everything the world could throw at them, that isn't Haki imbued. So whether that be weapons like swords or guns, or even established devastating devil fruit powers, such as the flames of the Mera Mera no Mi, or even the poison of the Doku Doku no Mi, there is going to be very little that can break your diamond facade whilst it is active. However, that really is a major, major point with this fruit. A user must invoke this fruit's powers. It's not like the Gomu Gomu no Mi, where Luffy's body is rubber even if Luffy is caught off guard. The user of the Kira Kira no Mi must be actively aware of when and what to turn into diamond. And an easy answer to that second question might be, well, why don't I just turn my entire body into diamond? I'd be invincible. Ha ha ha. You wouldn't necessarily be wrong, but this devil fruit comes with a very restrictive condition that I don't feel like a lot of people think about, which is that once part of your body has been morphed into diamond, you are no longer able to move that body part because it's a diamond. The Kira Kira no Mi is actually a lot like the Super Super no Mi wielded by Dust Bones, in that once he had turned part of his body into a blade, he lost all control of that body part. So what he had to do was strategically turn certain portions of his body into blades. Like for example, maybe he turned his fingers into them and then used his arm to thrust those blades at his opponent. It's very much the same deal with the diamond fruit. So for example, you could turn your entire arm into diamond, which Jozu does quite frequently, but it would be up to the rest of your body to make use of that diamond arm, which is very tricky because it means that by default, fault, your impenetrable defense is going to need a purposely chosen weak point where your body remains a regular fleshy human in order for you to make any use of this fruit whatsoever. But hey, what better way to explore this potential use than by delving into Diamond Jozu himself? And he very much put a hell of a lot of hype behind this fruit when he was successfully able to block a strike from the world's greatest swordsman, Dracul Mihawk. The strike, which was originally aimed at Whitebeard and may or may not have been catered to dealing with Diamond, but still very impressive nonetheless. As for offensive combat, Jozu mainly uses the Kira Kira no Mi to transform part of himself into diamond and then thrust himself towards an enemy at high impact in an attack that he has named Brilliant Punk, which is, you know, effectively the diamond version of a bull rushing at you with its static horns. It's not the most complex of attacks. However, if it does hit, that diamond is going to strike you hard especially when you consider the potential to imbue it with Haki, which we do know that Jozu has, because he was seen being capable of facing off against both Crocodile and Kuzan during the Paramount War, who are both low gear fruit users. In the curious case of Kuzan though, this was one of Jozu's less than finest moments, which very much demonstrates the severe weakness of needing to keep Devil Fruits active, as after losing concentration, Jozu found himself frozen by Kuzan's own Devil Fruit abilities. And due to the fragility of his non-diamond natural body, he actually ended up losing an arm in this encounter. Whereas if the Kira Kira no was somehow a fruit that kept the diamond goodness active the entire time, there's no way that Jozu would have been brittle enough to part with his limb here. So if you do consume this fruit, just remember to stay focused. Don't be like Jozu. Now to the ever anticipated world of awakenings, and this is where I think the bulk of potential for this fruit comes from actually. Being able to, assumedly, turn your environment into diamond is a very handy strategic device. In fact, it's entirely possible that with this power, you'd never have to turn your body into diamond again. You basically just need to focus on hitting your opponent and then manipulate 
manipulating the environment to provide maximum diamond impact upon whatever they land on. With that said though, rather than use such a thing for combat, my first thought would actually be to go into business. Because unlike most devil fruits with access to generation, we'd actually be crafting something society considers wildly valuable here. Especially if you have control of the source of said valuables to the point of being a monopoly. I mean, you could basically do what De Beers did in the real world, where they controlled something crazy like 80 to 85% of the world's diamond stock and used that advantage to artificially inflate their price by only releasing low numbers of product into the market at a time, making diamonds seem far, far more valuable than they were in reality. And even though that monopoly has been somewhat broken up these days, diamonds are still wildly overpriced. And I guess the only issue is that I suppose the monopoly would only last for your lifetime and upon your death, all of those awakened diamonds you've created may possibly just revert to whatever they were beforehand. Then again, you're dead, so this isn't necessarily a problem for you. Some other miscellaneous things to consider when becoming a diamond human. Funnily enough, this is another one of those intriguing fruits in the series, which may very well act as a natural counter to the absurdly powerful fan favorite light fruit, the Pika Pika no Mi. This is because there is basically no way that light could ever come to hurt something that is naturally reflective and refractive. So the user of the Pika Pika no Mi would have to rely solely on using their quote unquote light speed to send their regular fleshy body into combat with your diamond exterior, which doesn't sound like it would end very well for the light user. Also, it's probably a good idea to point out that while diamond is the hardest naturally occurring substance in the real world, that may not actually hold true for the One Piece realm. Due to the existence of sea stone or sea prism stone, or kairoseki or whatever you prefer to call it, it's all the same. In any case, this stuff is also nigh on indestructible by conventional means, plus it restricts devil fruit powers, so it is very much the ultimate rival to the user of the Kira Kira no Mi. Kind of like kryptonite to Superman. And also this is probably obvious to anyone who has made it this far in the video, but on the odd occasion, this devil fruit can be mistaken for a Logia. This is because it gives the illusion of the user essentially becoming diamond, which is an element in line with Logia theming. However, as I've stated a couple of times already, the user needs to take the initiative in terms of when and where this diamond body is invoked. It certainly does not make them permanently an element as other Logias do, and so it falls very firmly in the Paramecia camp. So what do we end up with here? Look, I think the Kira Kira no Mi is one of those fairly overrated fruits within the One Piece fanbase. The diamond aspect is undeniably phenomenal, but I don't think that a lot of people really appreciate just how difficult this fruit would be to wield effectively in any context, let alone high level combat, which is the default standard we often look at these powers from. So for the average person, I'm actually thinking that this may not be such a great choice if indeed you are presented with the choice of fruits to consume. There would undoubtedly be a fair chunk of daily life benefit here and there, but it's not something truly revolutionary like many other powers might provide. However, if you are truly committed to mastering the art of diamondization, then go for it because use of this power at its optimum levels is going to be absurdly difficult for any potential opponents to overcome. You just need to be pretty damn sure that you're the right person who can accomplish that because even a top tier user like Jozu found himself in a very tight spot with the restrictions of this fruit. So I guess all I can really leave you with is think very, very carefully before eating this one. And with that, we are going to commit the Kira Kira no Mi to the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia. Next week, we'll be getting into yet another fan favorite, also coming from a prominent member of the Whitebeard Pirates, this time being First Division Commander Marco and his mythical Zoan fruit, the Tori Tori no Mi Model Phoenix. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of your amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but applied to other anime and manga series, then please do check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenanigans retakes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the Kira Kira no Mi. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time. What's the difference between the observation haki that Rayleigh taught Luffy and the observation haki that he learned in his fight with Katakuri? It looked like Luffy was learning a haki style that he already had. Cool, so uh, you're right in that both instances Luffy was using Observation Haki. However, Rayleigh only taught Luffy the very basics of Haki, because in the Dark King's own words, Haki only truly blooms in the heat of battle. And in this particular fight, Katakuri was using a more advanced form of Observation Haki that allowed him to achieve this phenomenon where he can look into the future. And after seeing that in action, Luffy became determined to learn how to do that for himself. So he slowly, and I mean very slowly, pushed himself until he could wield it to some degree. 
Why did you pick your name? Hmm, all right. So Grand Line Review is a name that was effectively chosen, I would say more or less arbitrarily. Basically one day, many, many years ago, I was sitting on my couch and I thought, maybe I could talk about One Piece on YouTube. Doesn't seem all that difficult, right? The latter part of that mental statement was completely untrue. But after that moment, I did a bit of a brainstorming session on what I wanted the name of the channel to be. And at that time, all I knew was that I wanted to review chapters and maybe episodes. So I was determined to sneak the word review in there somewhere. And given that I wanted the channel to be entirely One Piece based, I was looking for a word to summarize the series or the world. And given that the large majority of it took place in the Grand Line, well, Grand Line review seemed kind of reasonable, like a newspaper or a periodical. And I didn't really think too far beyond that. I immediately made the YouTube account, and then I think I left it dormant for the better part of a year before I actually gave making content a go. And then an awfully long journey later, here we are today.